So it seems like the class is doing really well right now with the papers. Uh, we've gotten through most of them and they look really good. You should have gotten a grade. Uh, in some cases you should have gotten, some of you have been given an opportunity to rewrite some things and take that opportunity if you can and try to improve your grade. Um, but you're, this is a writing intensive class and I, I think you've already figured that one out. And uh, we're also here to help you learn to write better. And so you're absolutely welcome to send me, as many of you have, a copy of your drafts, copy of your ideas, enter into a discussion with me about what you're writing about and, um, and give me some examples and even a draft. And I'm glad to give you feedback before you finally submit that. And that's something that Jordan is also available to do. Now, today we're dealing with lesson nine and lesson 10. And with lesson nine, we talk about systems theory. If you are a biologist or an engineer or uh, anyone in the sciences, you have spent a lot of time working in systems theory. Systems theory is um, an anti-reductionist movement. That is to say that um, much of science originally thought that if you reduce something and reduce something and reduce something to the small, smallest particle like an atom, like a molecule, if you could just bring something down, you can find the essence of that. But now we are learning, we are looking in a more holistic way and understanding that in order to understand really how things are, that we have to understand the system, the ecosystem that they operate in. And that's true with human behavior and that's true with leadership. And so a systems theory version of leadership comes out. Here's a story that uh, I learned uh, that I heard from a, a consulting client I had a, a few years ago. It was a fairly small rural hospital. Imagine this a small rural hospital in an isolated part of the United States. And um, everybody in the community sort of knows everybody. It's the only hospital in the community. And uh, an ambulance pulls up in front of somebody's home. Somebody who's chronically ill, they put him in the ambulance. They take him to the hospital, to the emergency room. And he's having problems with his respiration, breathing problems. They knew he had been in, they knew that this was... Um, a possibility and it had been going on for a long time and when they arrived at the hospital the respiratory therapist was called into the emergency room and he there was a particular piece of equipment that he needed and he was able to uh, uh, that would have been able to it made him able to better serve this patient and uh, they couldn't find it uh, it was usually kept in one space and it wasn't there and so um, they kept looking and looking and looking for it. Um, the patient's condition got worse and worse and worse, and eventually uh, they had to transport the patient to another hospital, especially hospital that could help him better. And in that transportation, the patient died. The respiratory therapist was just devastated, just absolutely devastated uh, that this had happened on his watch. Um, it was just very difficult for him to talk about and see. And we were in a group of all the leaders you know, of the hospital, and this included the respiratory therapist. And with tears, uh, he described his feeling of helplessness as he didn't have the right equipment to solve this problem. Then came the admission that the um, custodial staff had moved the piece of equipment because it was never used or hardly ever used. And another admission from nursing that they had not trained on that piece of equipment because it was hardly ever used. And another admission from the HR department that said, you know, we didn't <coughs> um, support the training on that or buy the training on that because it was not often used. And uh, another admission from uh, the funding or the maintenance people that they hadn't maintained the equipment very well. And it went on and on and everybody in that room took a piece of the blame. It was amazing to me that everybody in the room took a piece of the blame. This is why, why systems thinking is so important because in a non-systems thinking world, we drill down and say, it's your fault. It's your fault that that happened. And you've worked for that person before, maybe. Maybe you um, understand that, but you've worked for that person who doesn't have a systems perspective. And so they can simplify something and blame somebody based on that simplification. But in a systems view the world is a complex place and everybody owns a piece of that when i was first starting on my search and rescue team first time i ever went on the mountain i was asked to build an anchor an anchor is something that 
um, a place where you can attach a rope so that will hold the weight of uh, maybe, um, well, a significant amount of weight, maybe 10 to 20,000 pounds. And so you build it around a tree. You do something called a wrap three, pull two um, around a tree, uh, around a, at the base of a tree, around a rock. And there were no trees or rocks in this place. And so I used two bushes and did the best I could. We always used several anchors and there were luckily two other anchors involved in this system and they were good anchors and mine was not. And uh, it was a difficult place to build an anchor and I didn't do a very good job of it. And my uh, friends on this team uh, each took responsibility for that. We didn't train Scott well enough. In fact, there are a lot of people here who are not trained well enough. And so our next training was on anchors. And then we practiced it and we rehearsed it and they showed us. And everybody took a piece of the blame and it made me feel so much better because I was devastated that I had done something wrong that could have put somebody's life in danger. And so that's the advantage of a systems perspective. If you've ever um, had a family difficulty and had somebody in your family who's um, getting therapy or getting um, fixed in some way, uh, you understand that good therapists now um, say, oh, that's the designated patient. That's the person who's designated as having problems. Um, but it's not just the patient's problem. It's the family's problem. And uh, every problem, uh, even addiction problems, are caused in some ways by a system, by a family, and by a social system. So that's the system's view of things. And uh, so I think that's why you will like and find chapter um, or lesson nine really important. In lesson 10, we start talking about ethics and um, <clears throat> the importance of ethics for, for leaders. And uh, most leaders say, well, I will just know what to do when it's right. You know, I don't know what's right to do. And, and, and you don't know. You have to think of those things ahead of time. One of the best things that I've heard from a good friend of mine who runs a major company in the United States is he says, every decision is an ethical decision. Every decision you make as a leader has some component of ethics involved in it, where you're trading off safety or someone's safety for um, someone's benefit, somebody's job security for somebody else's benefit. And so you have to think of those things. You have to think of everything you do in, in, in the form of a, as a possible ethical question. So that's, that's another thing that uh, as you read through this lesson, you ought to think about and, and work through. Um, now, I believe next week we are sitting on the bench because it is a holiday. And, um, but there's another holiday this Friday uh, that I think some of you are going to be involved in called Valentine's Day. I wish you all a happy Valentine's Day. I am taking my wife to a um, concert that she doesn't know about and there will be flowers provided. So I hope you all have a great Valentine's Day and make somebody happy on that day. And then I hope you all have a good President's Day the next week. And, uh, and uh, then I will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.